Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us here. I know that this is a topic of conversation, uh, not just inside the Congress Center, but outside of it as well. ESG is clearly the buzzword, and I'm glad that we have four individuals here, four leaders, who've spent a lot of their time, their bandwidth, and their capital uh, working the needle on this one. So it's going to be good to have their points of view on where things currently stand and what more needs to be done more importantly. Uh, in light of the tumultuous times that the global economy is faced with, there is a fair amount of turbulence and uncertainty. Uh, the expectation is that could this now set back uh, goals of sustainable development? Could this set back the ESG agenda that a lot of corporations and governments were focusing on? Or could it, in fact, accelerate the move towards more cleaner energy, make those transitions happen sooner, and reduce the dependence on the old style of doing things? But there is limited fiscal resources uh, that governments are dealing with. Uh, there is enough uh, capital that the private sector is willing to put uh, to deploy uh, and use to try and uh, ensure that we move forward and in addressing some of these problems. But it is a complex challenge. What has happened in the last few years, and especially here at the World Economic Forum, is putting together a metric uh, of reporting, of uh, uh, putting together a framework that makes it easier for people to understand how to measure the outcomes of what is being done. And that's uh, something that we are going to talk about here uh, as part of this conversation as well. So let me introduce our panelists today. Uh, joining me, Laura M. Cha, the chairman of the Hong Kong Exchange and Clearing at Hong Kong, China. Thanks very much for joining us here, Laura. Emmanuel Farber, chair of International Sustainability Standards Board, IFRS Foundation of the UK. Alan Jope, the chief executive officer at Unilever. And Brian Monaghan, the chairman and CEO of Bank of America. Uh, and of course, he's also the chair of the World Economic Forum's International Business Council. Uh, Laura, gentlemen, thanks very much for joining us here. Brian, let me start by asking you, since you were the early mover as far as the WEF's ESG IBC Council was concerned, do you fear that given the volatility and the turbulence the global economy is faced with today, that we're going to see a setback or an acceleration uh, on ESG? So thank you. And uh, no, I don't feel there'll be a setback. And so we can stop with that answer. Or we can go uh, more broadly. But the reality is that operating companies have made commitments uh, you know, along multiple dimensions. And so you know, when a company makes a commitment and they're customers, their employees, their shareholders, their, the societies they operate in see that commitment. You know, it, you can't just say, oh, it's inconvenient right now. And so those commitments are longstanding. It goes to who the companies are, what they are. Um, and so, you know, if you think about the, the International Business Council, you know, over the last three years, we started developing metrics that we thought were common enough across industry where material would cause the consolidation of the thought process of the multiple metrics, uh, but more importantly, statements of what capitalism can do to solve what the world needs from us. The SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, you know, say this is what the world wants from us. We have a tagline in our advertising, what would you like the power to do? The world told us mm -hmm. in, in a number of years ago, 190 countries, whatever it was, said this is what we need. It takes $6 trillion to finance those a year. People have debates for six, eight, but some big number. And the only way you're going to do it is to take charity can't do it, not enough money, wonderful, not enough money. Governments don't have the fiscal capacity. Capitalism has to do it, and stakeholder capitalism is the definition. The metrics measure that. They're against those SDGs. 140 companies adopting it. So how can they go backwards? They've told, you know, they've, they've, they're in our annual report. They're in other people. Say, how can how can they say, oh, this, you know, there's a disruption. We got to watch. It's, it goes to the core of who those companies are and how to do it. And Klaus with his leadership over 50 years, you know, it's all come together. So I don't see there's a way you can walk away from it because your customers won't let you, your employees won't let you. Your shareholders shouldn't, uh, won't let you. And by the way, society won't let you. Well, I, I certainly hope that that is the case. And Alan, that's exactly what I want to talk to you about. How important is it that we now have this metric framework in place, uh, that it is starting to influence customer behavior, it's starting to influence investor behavior as well. What are the changes that you've seen on that front? Well, look, it's been a torrid time for the world uh, over the last two or three years. Um, but one constant is that Unilever's investors have exhorted us to continue on the path of putting sustainability at the heart of our business model. And I think the reason uh, that we're getting that feedback is for hard commercial purposes. Unilever is not an NGO. Uh, we're a commercial organization. And we're finding more and more evidence on, let me just pick three axes, 
consumers, particularly young people, are making brand choices based on the social and environmental impact. Our sustainable brands um, that, that outperform on environmental or social contribution are growing much faster than the rest of our portfolio. Secondly, we've got to get away of this, uh, we've got to get out of this thought that sustainable business is more costly. Mm. It is in some places, but net, we believe we've saved about 1.2 billion euros of cost by getting onto efficient energy early. And the third reason is uh, the talent proposition. Try attracting uh, people to join your organization if you're not clear on what you stand for. Um, and so uh, we are staying the course on sustainable business and a part of that is reporting non-financial metrics uh, because we think it makes good sound business sense. It makes good sound business sense. And Laura, let me address that issue with you as well. Uh, you know, hopefully gone are the days when uh, disclosures would be tucked away in companies' annual reports and nobody would care about them. Now they're front and center. They're being yeah. talked about, uh, not just in rooms like this one, but as part of investor presentations, as part of shareholder commitments that are being made as well. What's the big change that you now foresee? We've come a long distance, but as you look down the road ahead, what is the big change that you now anticipate seeing? I think um, we started with disclosure. And uh, for Hong Kong Exchange, we started the journey in 2013 when we provide guidelines for listed companies to disclose their ESG policy, their ESG work, et cetera. And then we elevated to mandatory requirement, and that was in 2017. And what we need to do now, is exactly as you suggested, is to go beyond and to make those disclosure meaningful. We need, in order for the, mean, for the disclosure to be meaningful, we need to have harmonized standard. Right now, there's a plethora of uh, different standards everywhere. Now, I recognize that for different industry, there will be different matrix and different measurements, but it will be very good in terms of the work that ISSB is doing to bring out some standardized global measures and standards so that the disclosure to the investors, to the community would be measurable <laughs> and clear and understandable. I think that's the mix, mix, mix perhaps. And, and that's what I want to address with yeah. each one of you. And Emmanuel, I get, I'll get you to address that first. Uh, you know, to Laura's point, uh, that you've got a plethora of regulations across different sectors, across different jurisdictions, across different geographies, and perhaps it makes things harder. These might be well-intentioned, but it actually does the opposite. It makes things harder uh, for business to be able to operate. Uh, do you really see now the time for a global framework as far as measurement and reporting is concerned? The need for that is now? Thanks, uh, Shirin, for asking. Yeah, I wouldn't have taken this job if I had thought otherwise, frankly. Um, and, and to your question to uh, Brian about the setback, I, I think that there is no setback. What um, was seen as important, but maybe not urgent, is now also becoming urgent. Uh, and so the need to adapt supply chains, the need to change the way we operate, uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 the COVID and then the Ukraine situation have aggravated factors that are material for companies in their resilience and in their performance. And so the ability to have a language to share that with their investors and for um, the people that provide capital to these companies um, in an understanding of what matters now in the mid and in the long term has never been as uh, important and urgent as now. And this is the feedback we receive. Now, to your point, many jurisdictions, and that's fortunate, have started to work on those. And before that, there have been a number of um, private standard set organizations. And there is an absolute need to align in order to simplify the cost of reporting for companies and the comparability for investors and bankers, insurance uh, companies, et cetera. It's not just the cost of compliance, though, Brian, isn't it? I mean, just to be able to manage, and you would understand because you're operating across different jurisdictions and, uh, jurisdictions and geographies. What is the message to policymakers, to global uh, leaders at this point in time, to take into context what we just heard from Emmanuel and Laura? Well, so one of the efforts of the, the IBC metrics was convergence. A, a parallel path was to, mm -hmm. to, it was to get the recognition, not the formal setters. There, that, there's actually a modest amount of formal setting going. It's, it's emerging. Because we started this, this idea that Emmanuel's leading now did not exist. It was the informal setters. And everybody could have an opinion and everybody could do it. And what you're trying to do is get convergence among all that because then the work goes down from 
work in the reporting side and the standardization, all the arguments about safe harbors and legal liability and all this stuff, and the work goes into actually doing the work. Mm. And so, you know, so that, that was the important thing. So, yes, it's hard to comply with all the different things and, and to have variances between different, you know, Alan's company, my company operate all over the world. And so we're very much into materiality, straightforward, ones that go across industry, and as, as it was talked about, you can have specific industry ones underneath it. One that cover all the aspects, not just the environmental aspect, which is you know the uh, 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 tax paying and all the stuff that are covered by the metrics, which was not uncontroversial, frankly, in the dialogue with mm. the companies. Uh, but we used the big four accounting firms who consolidated yes. all that and said, here's the metrics, and they did a wonderful job. And so that, that consolidation, that simplification, that allows everybody to have a common playing field, a common standard. And then capital flow to companies that are doing profits and purpose. Not, it's, not a, it's a false choice to say it's or, it's and. And that's what you have to agree, or else Al and I won't be in our jobs very quickly if we can't deliver profits and purpose, right? And, and, and so you have to have that. And then, you know, the second th thing, you have to have people saying, I will reward that activity. And that's where the simpl simplification, the standardization, and frankly, materiality is important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to Brian's point about being able to converge passion, profit, purpose, uh, and, and I know Unilever is a big believer in that as well. But what are the big challenges that you see? We talked about, uh, you know, global supply chain disruptions, building resilient supply chains at this point in time that also uh, keep in mind the ESG goals that we want yeah. to attain. What are the big challenges that you see around uh, you at this point in time? So, uh, Shireen, the, the question of what are the big challenges that we see at Unilever is a 90-minute answer uh, <laughs> in the current circumstances. I'll try and keep it to uh, the subject of uh, non-financial metrics and ESG metrics. Um, well, Unilever has been fairly advanced on this idea of reporting non-financial performance, um, <clears throat> planetary footprint, social footprint, for 20 years now. So we want to be at the leading edge of this. But I think we're at a point of great danger right now. Um, we are in danger of letting uh, perfect get in the way of good, of letting complex get in the way of simple, and of letting local get in the way of global. Because uh, the work that Brian led brilliantly in the IBC has pulled together 160 companies from multiple sectors around a relatively simple and measurable and reportable set of standards. The professional work uh, that Emmanuel's leading is uh, exactly how you take uh, the IBC work and, and take it to a professional standard setting. But we are in danger of different jurisdictions setting extremely onerous standards that are different from each other. And that would be a setback, not a step forward for ESG metrics. And I think that point has been well made here uh, on the panel. But Brian, you talked about capital. Uh, and let's address that issue because you said that it is going to be private capital uh, that will provide the solutions to many of these issues and many of these challenges that we face uh, globally. What we are seeing, and I, I come from India, and what we are seeing at this point in time is a lot of ESG-linked funds moving money into renewable energy, moving money into green technology, <laughs> clean technology, uh, agri-based uh, uh, businesses, and so on and so forth. Where do you see the flow of capital in the context of the ESG goals today? And what kind of money are we now talking about as we move forward? Well, so we, we have $4 trillion round numbers in the Merrill Lynch and a private bank platform, which investors you know, are asking us down to the individual account holder invest, you know, consistent with the research that we publish uh, through our research team that companies who don't perform well on these types of metric systems, uh, if you avoid those companies, you avoid the bankruptcies, you avoid the losers. So that, that's going on. But, but honestly, what we're trying to do by aligning the companies against it is which would, which would you rather have, the $25 billion of funds that have been developed or $30 billion in ESG products, and there's a lot of that going on, or would you rather have the, the annuity stream that's our $60 billion operating base every day put to work, or the $3 trillion balance sheet we have put to work in that way, or Allen's operating base? And if you take all the operating expenses of all the companies in the world, and you think about dedicating that to move, you know, constantly in a way. So our purchase of power is $100 million th uh, a year. That's not going to change the course of history, but we can do a solar installation, as we've done with Duke in North Carolina, to get more clean power so we can keep meeting that goal of our direct power usage. But you take a whole bunch of companies, that creates an investable revenue stream. That's the recurring nature of capitalism, which is a profit motive means the money isn't given away and then it has a return to perpetuate from the investor side. That, you know, 200,000 people, a $3 trillion balance sheet. 
50, 60 billion expenses. You start aiming that gun, that, that, and you take that across all these companies, it is huge, mm -hmm. as opposed to you know, government trying to fund it out of their pockets. Yeah. So that's, that's the alignment of capitalism. So the investors will, are also important because they'll then say the companies are profits and purpose and delivering on the metrics will get more capital and the ones that won't will get less. That'll keep, that'll keep pushing people in a direction. But it's, it's actually the operating companies will make the change happen. The net zero commitments by the operating companies Gross. around COP26 are unbelievable if you start to think them through. The activity that they force downstream is just unbelievable. And by the way, companies like Allen and stuff have been doing this for years, but think about the volume of companies that are committed now. Yeah, absolutely. You're right in pointing that out. Emmanuel, what I want to address with you, and I was talking to a CEO yesterday who said that we need to change the way that we look at return on capital employed, and we need to look at it as return on environment and climate. Are you starting to see this kind of a paradigm change, a paradigm shift across corporations, uh, more so not just the large ones, but even the mid-sized ones as well? Well, I think what we clearly see is that there is no CEO, frankly, today that um, is not wondering uh, about the mid uh, to long-term resilience of uh, her or his business uh, in terms of um, both environmental and social, I would say. Um, again, what's really missing in uh, the ability to execute is a language that allows that discussion to happen at the board level with the shareholders uh, and to connect with what matters because for the time being, accounting accounts but doesn't count what counts as well. And we absolutely need to have that on top. So whether you call it a return on whatever, but the question is uh, really to create those metrics and as, as uh, Alan said, in a manner that is not onerous because if we want it to be used uh, broadly, we want it to be simple, as simple as possible. But to be very clear, it's not going to happen in one day. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about at the end of the day, a different sort of accounting, at the end of the day, a long journey. And that language needs to be developed. It needs, it needs to be learned by many people. We are lacking talents. Companies are lacking talents today. Even standard setting uh, you know, is, is an activity where we need to continue to learn and educate. So as much as we are building this grammar uh, for this language, uh, we need to realize that you know, capacity building has got to be there. SMEs, emerging markets, there needs to be proportionality. And I, I think, as uh, Brian said, materiality is absolutely fundamental. Mm -hmm. we, we are actually in the sustainability one of the IFRS proposal. We are saying, if it's not material, don't report it. If you think climate is not material, don't even report climate. That's as far as what we go. So you need to be super pragmatic if you want to embark everyone here. Mm -hmm. Laura, you know, just to take Emmanuel's point forward, mm -hmm. uh, as we develop this new vocabulary, this new yes. grammar, this new narrative, where do you find the most disconnect? Where are the biggest gaps that you see today? I think in for, certainly on our market, on the public market, a lot of the complaints that we heard are from the SMEs, exactly like uh, Emmanuel said. Because we can talk about all these global standards in different industries and so on. Disclosure to some of the SME are costly. Mm. They don't see the benefit. And so for us as, the, um, as a market regulator, as a market operator, we need to educate that sector of the society, of the community. Really, we, on the XGEX, we run a ESG academy just to cater to the need of the SMEs to tell them how in each of their way, in small ways, not, not with lofty goals, to meet the ESG requirement. There are small things that they can do and to understand the importance and then to meet the investor demand and the society's demand. There is more and more uh, demand, not only just in the big corporates, but from the community as a whole. And with the, you know, I think with the uh, pandemic, these become very, very much in the forefront. Mm -hmm. People now become to realize that ESG is not just something you talk about. There are some real impact on being prepared, being ready to, to tackle the next pandemic or whatever crisis that come along. So it's from that angle that I think the exchange can play a role. And yes, we fine. You want to make a point? Well, just to follow that SME, and you know, we are the largest middle market bank in the U.S. and the, one of the largest small business lender in the U.S. So one of the programs we have going is to educate those lending officers to talk to their clients because when, if you have the net zero commitment coming from the 
supply chain, a company sells to consumers or sells to businesses. If they sell to businesses, the net zero is coming at them. They sell to consumers, the product that they sell will have it. So what we're trying to do is educate those customers. Not you know, The idea is we're going to stick with you, but you have to start to think about this because at some point, companies like ours are making purchase decisions about the net zero commitments of our supply chain. That's the wonder that people, it's, it, it's hard for people to put their mind around when you start to say, the, all these commitments by these companies as effectuated through their supply chains changes dramatically the way, would pick your metric, pick your, what's well, environmental is easiest to people visualize. It moves a lot, but we've got to get the rest of the world ready to go because you know, the, the maker of a part of a car yeah. will be under a certain demand cycle. The maker of mm -hmm. the tubes that go into, you know, the, the uh, packaging for the products that go out at Allen's companies under demand. And so we're just saying to them, learn about this. Don't think this is other people's problems. It's going to become your problem. If you're a distributor, it's your problem. If it's a, you know, if you're a grocery, everybody has to think about this. And that then creates activity, again, bringing the entirety of the expense base of all operating companies in the world, mm. the entirety of the market capitalization. Suddenly the number of six, nine billion, whatever it is a year, yeah, that's not so big. It isn't, but you know, I think you make a valid point there, Laura, and I, I think what I'm hearing from each one of you, it's especially as far as uh, the mid-sized corporations are concerned, uh, the, the issue of proportionality of action and the impact that it has, it's not just about the compliance burden or the cost of compliance, uh, and it's not just about the lack of ability or capability or capacity building within the organization. How are you, for instance, Alan, helping your supply chain understand not just the importance, but also perhaps handhold them to be able to achieve and walk the same path that you're sure. working on? So think about, I love uh, the, the argument that Brian's making that if we really want to have impact, it has to go from government and regulators into the capitalist system and big companies, small and medium-sized enterprises, but actually the ultimate democratization, the ultimate way of moving markets is when the consumer is voting with her wallet. And uh, so two things that we think are important. First of all, we've pledged that we will only do business with suppliers who are, for example, paying their people properly a fair living wage. We will only do business with suppliers who have made uh, net zero commitments. So we can take our impact into the entire universe of people who work with our company. But then the final step will be, think about it, 20 years ago, none of us knew what a kilocalorie was. But now you look at a pack and you uh, see very clearly, oh, it's, you look at the kilocalories, and you know that 50 is not too many, you don't have to worry about it too much. 500 kilocalories on a, on a, a product, you'll think twice about it. We, sh we need to do the same for carbon. We need to let consumers make the choice about the carbon impact of their decisions. And uh, that requires uh, uh, standardization um, so that we're all able to label, for example, the carbon footprint of different products that we buy um, and let the market decide and the market will move towards low carbon alternatives. So I think that's the final flush through the system is when the end user is making the decision and changing the system. So, yeah, right. So just to follow through a different uh, segment of consumer, uh, the group of companies in the Sustainable Markets Initiative, which uh, were involved with Prince Charles and stuff, on the fashion industry has developed a you know, QR code you can hit that goes provenance from a standpoint of where you know, where the cotton came from. Mm -hmm. Was it mm -hmm. done the right way? It also goes on the repair side, which is interesting, goes provenance of this 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 was you know, 2005, you know 2022, done in this month with this fabric. So if yeah. it needs to be repaired, it saves them months of trying to figure out how to do it. So that changes the wearability for longer term. And then on top of that is provenance for the asset, which is the higher end luxury retailers, now this is a proved, proven asset. And so you start to think it all from the technology allows everything, the consumer to see everything from supply chain mm -hmm. through how they can you know, match uh, with uh, you know, the, the, the wool and the, and the sweater 20 years later. It's and really, you need standards to do yeah, that yeah. with uh, integrity. And it's, and it's just amazing to see that consumerism take hold of the demand. I want to know the product was produced in a way, yeah. to Alan's point. And that, that, People forget that engine's the other side of it. So it's us businesses making net zero commitments and the consumers driving us at the same time and that standardization, transparency, that's where the government can help move this faster. But Emmanuel, you know, to point, uh, both the points that Brian as well as Alan just made, that the consumer should drive these decisions, the consumer will vote uh, with the wallet. Uh, but to ensure that there is accountability, there needs to be adequate transparency as well. I mean, place of origin and things like that have now sort of been part of uh, how we operate business. But, 
you know, how do you know what's going on as far as your supply chain is concerned? You can put, how many things do you put on a, on a pack? How many things do you put on a label to ensure that that kind of transparency is available to the consumer? Well, yes, I mean, it's, it could be a, a one hour discussion, so I'm probably more. Uh, but I, I think this is uh, a couple of things. One, the granularity of transparency is super important. We can't stay at the taxonomy levels of any jurisdiction because they are linked to a certain political consensus and they might be changing tomorrow. So if you look at the long term, you need to go deeper than the taxonomies to indeed look at the energy mix for instance, of any company in any country to avoid that it's blue one day, green, brown another day. The same happens for whatever is going to be about calories or whatever is going to be about local, not local, etc., etc. So facts. Second, we are not going to say what's good or what's bad. We are just providing the information for people to make decisions. And people are all around this room, including consumers, obviously, but many more, obviously. Where there is, uh, I think, an additional, uh, absolutely uh, groundbreaking work and task in front of us is about this piece about education and support that Unilever and others are providing for their farmers and for their supply chains and for etc. And, and what Brian was saying about uh, his customers, but I, I think it cannot be only business. Of course, it's got to be businesses with their scope three in a way or value chain, supply chains, ecosystems. But there is um, something to be done by multilateral. When you think about building capacity in emerging market for small and medium-sized enterprise, informal economy, this is about the next generation of development and the next generation of economics here. So I think that capacity building should be looked at on all of these topics at a multilateral level. And I would take part of that responsibility. We, we consider, we're considering at ISSB that if our mission is to create a truly global baseline, not a baseline for North America, EU, and Japan, or whatever, but a truly global baseline. It's got to be very ambitious, but with, as I said, a capability building and a, you know, a pathway for those companies, those SMEs, and countries that may not be there yet to get there. And that will require, on top of education and others, probably the development of digital solutions, um, you know, tools that could be um, you know, implemented easily uh, by those entities that cannot report and have the 100 people that it would take at a multinational company to do that. Um, and I have to say this is a completely new aspect of that, but that is a very essential aspect if you want all those value chains to be actually inclusive and not exclusive of the goods and the bad people in a way. Well, yes, I think technology can be leveraged and deployed, and that's an important point that you make. But Emmanuel, a follow-up question, since you talked about the need for a multilateral framework to address the issue that you just spoke of. We're living in a world where multilateralism is under threat at this point in time. So, you know, how, how confident do you feel about being able to move down this path? Well, um, I, I, of course it's a challenge, but, uh, and that's back to your first question, I think, Sharon, but... Um, you know, we just, uh, just to give you an example, a week ago, literally Monday last week, we convinced the first ever uh, working group of jurisdictions on sustainability standard alignment and global lines. And there was China, Japan, UK, US, and EU for a long conversation. And that's, that's just the start. And I can tell you all these jurisdictions, and there are many more, are actively currently working on these topics. And they understand that for some of these markets, access to global capital markets is going to be essential. Mm -hmm. So it's essential for their companies to comply with what, you know, as banks like you know, Bank of America and others, investors, private equity companies mm -hmm. are using now ESG metrics. The largest private equity companies are using those metrics today, which are an alphabet we know, for all their due diligence on their deals. Mm -hmm. And they know that if they want to exit in IPO, if you know, three years from now they don't use it, there will not be that. So the cost of capital is going to be raised. I think many, many more people understand that um, moving capital allocation is the name of the game if we want to indeed go for a transition that's going to be resilient for business in a way and therefore for our economies because that's no difference. And for that, jurisdictions are ready to step up and to try as much as possible to align. And we are serving as a platform for that. You know, to the private equity and the capital point of view, Brian, I wanted you to comment on what you heard from Emmanuel, but also take that forward. 
you know, 2021 has been a record year in terms of private equity deals. But do you see as we move ahead that this is going to be front and center in making those decisions on where the money goes, who the money goes to, how much the money goes? So, to whom? There, you know, there are two different notions here. One are the specialized funds that have been developed to do things. But the reality that Emmanuel's talking about is the same thing that we're talking about with regular operating companies and asset managers, is you bring it across the whole fund. In other words, that if you're, if you're, a lot of the, the private equity enterprises are public companies themselves, so they are in the same disclosure. Yeah. As you watch them, and we we work with a group at the SMI led by James Brockdale, you know, you can see them sort of seeing that. Wait, I'm a public operator, so I've got the, the burdens, but I got to get my portfolio companies just like us with our lending clients. We got to get them up to speed because we can't get there unless they get there. And if I'm going to exit, so the, bringing these standardizations away from just the you know, in the U.S. context, the SEC disclosure to actually the uh, where the uh, uh, sort of the, the, the professionalism, as, as Alan said, then nobody can hide from this. There can't be the you know the basic notion that you can divest a uh, a bad part of your company to the private equity and they can take it outside the system. All that starts to go away, and those companies are committed to the same metrics across their entire portfolio. Mm. And if that that's the interesting difference going on, yeah. so there was record numbers of deals done, and that'll ebb and flow, and that'll do. But the reality is watching these private equity companies with the same principles saying, wait a second, I've got to have all my portfolio companies there, and it can't be just be the specialized fund. The specialized fund may be more catalytic in terms of technology or transformation and things like that. But the real basic the question is all their money has to be invested against this, or else they're not going to get support from their investors, which are the pension funds and others that yeah. are going to give them the money to invest in, 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 in individuals. So it's a, it's a business system of having everybody say this is a set of metrics we can agree with, with yeah. that, yeah, yeah, then, yeah. that it go across the entire economy. That's the difference. Sure, the checks and balances run through. But Alan, you know, to the technology point that Emmanuel brought up, and I want to understand that from, from your perspective on what you've been able to do within Unilever to leverage the power of technology to be able to achieve some of these goals. So uh, we have uh, one of our most senior financial leaders um, just below executive board level, dedicated only to sustainability reporting. And uh, she has a very large team, and we are struggling. We're struggling with the most basic ability to measure uh, some of these uh, uh, difficult to measure areas. And with so if Unilever is struggling, imagine. And, and with imagine humility, the rest. I think we've been at this for a while. So the. Uh, uh, exhortations from uh, Emmanuel that we need an on-ramp that's easy for SMEs uh, to, to get their feet wet in this space. The uh, exhortation from Laura that uh, her exchange needs comparable information. I just want to underscore this point about please can we keep it simple initially. Let's not perfect get in the way of good yeah. Yeah. and let's beware um, multiple standards in multiple jurisdictions or if jurisdictions insist on setting their own standards, then at least have some reciprocity so that we recognize good work from other parts of the world. Um, so yes, that's a confession. We're struggling, and I think we're not bad at this. And that's, that, that is quite a statement to be, to be heard yeah. here in this room from Unilever saying that they're struggling to be able to just get this done. But, but right. take technology across the thing. So what I talked about in the fashion industry, that enables a consumer with a swipe to see all that information, right? Take technology in the sense that um, you know, it's going to, in a portfolio, you know, if, you, if you think over the last several decades, to the you know, $5,000 account in our investment group, if there are 10 consumer products companies in there, and your letter is a good company and X is not a good company, they could say remove that to that level of account size. So you democratize through technology the ability to have individuals have an impact on where capital goes. Which that, so there's, it, this technology just changed everything. So it's hard, it is difficult, and we agree, and it, it takes talent, and this is why we've got to make it not burdensome that Emmanuel and Alan said. But we have to also be aware that technology has enabled consumer choice, the, you know, broad investor choice, and it's going to just skip all the people between them in the decision. So, uh, how you fly, how you go at hotels you go to, how you make consumer price decisions, but also I can take a portfolio and actually drop people out, which you just said you can't do that. You can now do that very granularly, and 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 so it's kind of an interesting thing that you see in the investor patterns. It's, again, it's not the specialized funds. Mm -hmm. It's people are saying, give me a portfolio without these energy companies, but keep these in. 
give me a portfolio, and, and they, we can do that. that that's where technology is changing the game, even at that level. Mm -hmm. Laura, you know, to the point that we've heard here from, from uh, Alan, Emmanuel, and Brian, uh, you know, compliance and governance mm -hmm. are two different things. Yes. I mean, you can tick the boxes as far as right. compliance is concerned, but governance is an entirely different yes. matter altogether. Mm -hmm. Are you worried that while we might see companies do well on compliance, not necessarily on governance, as well as perhaps concerns around the quality of disclosures? Well, I think actually, if we took a <clears throat> ESG, I think G is actually the most important one to start with. Mm. I'm not saying that E or S are less, but if you don't have good governance, you don't have a strong institution, if you don't have good direction and, the, um, and espousing the same kind of uh, uh, principles, you're not going to be able to achieve your E and S uh, policies. So I think governance is the first one. The govern, you know, your institution has to be strong, has to be forward looking and practice what you are talking. And that include you know, good governance, include diversity, inclusivity, all of those elements that make an institution strong. And then if with a strong institution, then you are resilient. And we were talking about resilience. Resilience is meaning it's preparedness, readiness. And you have prepared, you're ready, then you can execute those um, E and S aspect of it. So I think governance is very important. It's not just about ticking boxes. It's you know, investor and the community look at you as an institution, look at us, HKEX, as an institution. What do we do? It's not just for we to issue the guidelines, to issue the rules, but we let by example. And we do, you know, we, we really uh, not only just talk, but we do the walk as well. I think if each institution can do that, that is a very good place to start. Emmanuel? Uh, yeah, I'd just like to double down yeah. on what Laura said. Thank you for sharing this, Laura, because uh, there was, there's actually one vaccine against ESG greenwashing that was in Washington that was invented, I think, five years ago. And that's when TCFD was adopted and pushed by the G20 leaders. Um, we believe so much in that, that we've taken TCFD, which is climate initially, uh, from climate to the overall arching uh, uh, sustainability standard for us as a principle. And TCFD is not about metrics and targets, it's not about that. It's not about only risks and opportunities, it's not about only strategy and how you are designing mitigation, transition strategies, adaptation, etc. It's about the governance of it. And you are not meeting our standards if you're not responding on those core components of TCFD. And governance means how much do you have someone next to the exco doing all of this? How much do you have incentive for your teams about this? How much do you have a board that knows something about it or doesn't? How much time does the board spend? How much you know, risk committees have been re reviewing all of this? How much at the end of the day, the connectivity between finance, accounting, and that part, which one day and again will become, there will be you know, transitions between accounting and these ESGs. So I just want to repeat, TCFD is fundamental. And they've asked for the creation of ISSB and so have been the, the WEF and the IBC, et cetera. We really see ourselves as a legacy in terms of standards setting to this because this is a huge um, you know, protection against the greenwashing and having a target that nobody cares uh, in the company, including at the board level. You know, we're talking about standards, metrics, indices. Uh, I want to address Elon Musk's tweet, and Brian, I'm going to get you to comment on that. Uh, you know, Musk tweeting that ExxonMobil finds itself at the top of an ESG ranking and Tesla doesn't belong there. Uh, what's wrong with the world? Uh, that, not sure there's anybody could address that comment. But, uh, <laughs> uh, look, we, we as a company made a decision. We will not be dependent on anybody rating us. We're going to do what we believe is right, and we're going to lay it out to the shareholders. We're going to lay it out to people, and so we have the same problem, and we can't even figure out why. You know, so you're carrying around companies we acquired, you know, 15 years ago, who had a lawsuit that get you knocked out on this thing. This is part of this proliferation and lack of materiality, for, you know, for a for a dollar amount that is irrelevant because it's another company, but you're still it still knocks you down to rating. So I, I can understand the frustration with that. That's why we went in the WEF to a simple set of metrics that everybody could agree to. By the way, one of the metrics includes the TCFD. Do yes. you disclose it or not? Why don't you? So there, we didn't go back and make it up. So my view is that 
at, at Bank of America, we put it in the end report, we tell you how we operate it, we, we say this is how we deliver for the shareholders, this is how we deliver for the other constituencies. Uh, and so I can understand the frustration because I have the same frustration when I look at some of those things. But the reality is, you know, the CEOs of these companies have signed on this, Emmanuel Singh, have deep architectures, commitments that we admit are hard, that we admit are not perfect, that we admit are doing, but there, you know, there's a commitment there. And we will lay that out for people that we believe us to our shareholders and to our customers and to our teammates and to, you know, communities. We don't need a lot of people between us and that. You know, if it's straightforward enough, they ought to be able to understand whether they're doing the right thing. And so there's a, I can understand the distinction, but I've never built it to try to, I, you know, to say how do we get better rated for this one or that one. I, to me, that's a false choice. Do the work and it will come through. I'll hold up the mic for you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, the, there are about 15 different credible ranking systems of companies right now. And of course, we've looked at how Unilever stacks up on, uh, on all of them. And on average, we do quite well, but there are a couple where we don't do very well at all. Um, and this is exactly the point of this conversation. You shouldn't be able to pick and choose the index that you, uh, that you demonstrate your credentials against. And so um, I think Elon can relax because there's plenty of other uh, rating systems out there where I'm sure Tesla will come out absolutely top of the pack. Um, and the real point is we shouldn't pick and choose rating systems. There should be a common standard. Uh, that we can all use as uh, asset owners, asset managers, and companies. And that's exactly the work that uh, Emmanuel is leading, and, and I think it's an important piece of work. We'll have to check if he tweets back to you. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've got about uh, two minutes left. If there's a question here, uh, there's two hands up here already. We'll get a microphone to you. Uh, there's a gentleman right here and a lady right there. I'll give the lady the first opportunity, and then we'll get to the gentleman. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having me here. Um, I'm Camila from Global Shapers Community. Uh, we talk about like metrics, um, standards, language. So with come language, uh, to talk about language, we need to talk about adaptation, resilience. And so what, from your perspective, how we can address culture to the ESG equation, because um, especially for the South Global, if we don't adapt our language for culture, maybe people we, we don't understand. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, let me get Emmanuel to respond to that, and then I'll get to you, sir. Emmanuel. Uh, yeah, thank you, Camille. I mean, it's an incredible, difficult, and important question because I, I fundamentally believe that culture is more important than anything else that we've been discussing for one, one hour now. Uh, what I have committed is to have um, uh, an international board that's going to be fully independent and uh, very diverse in terms of cultures, including Global South. I'm deeply committed to this. I, I, I live and work in a number of emerging countries, and I'm deeply convinced that indeed without uh, our language to be addressable mentally and culturally, that will not fly. And yet, that's got to be a global language. So it's a huge challenge. Um, and I can't say more than just a commitment uh, to take that into account in the way we work. In a transparent manner, all the board, I mean, in talking culture, all the board meetings are going to be public. Anyone can attend You know, when we meet and decide about what are going to be the standards. And th there will be a number of, uh, of items that we want to make sure reflect mm -hmm. that openness and inclusiveness that I think you address you know, for the right reasons. Yes, sir. Go ahead. So, Emmanuel, you have the most difficult job in the world. The last time there was an innovation in the accounting was 1492, and the double entry standards were discovered. So, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my question to actually, uh, maybe Brian, to you is uh, when I talk to the CEOs, I'm, uh, my name is Subhash. I'm uh, CEO of a company called GEP. Uh, we are supplier to both of you guys. All the CEOs are genuinely committed to the ESG. But when we go to the next level of uh, managers, I think there is a disconnect. They still don't have proper budgets, tools, uh, and the mandate. I think there's, that disconnect needs to be uh, <coughs> reduced. Any comments on that? I, well, I think, yeah, it's, it's the business systems that you build around it so that, you yeah the measurement systems, the metrics. So as we look at 
say diversity, we measure it down. We're seven levels in our company. There's 200,000 people. Everybody has it in their quarterly reports to me. Every single level, every single movement across all the different dimensions. So there's no place to hide. Are you making progress or not? You know, transfers in, transfers out, new hires, you know, people left. Every, it's all out there. And then we put the roll up of that into the to world. So I think it is about how you measure that. Now, the trick is, you know, how do you get into the environment for the commercial banking group? You know, how do they think about it? First is educate them, they educate the customers, and then you start to think about, you know, our portfolio uh, target commitments for, 20, you know, for our net zero commitments and how you sort of allocate that out. So those business systems, as Alan kind of mentioned, are still developing, but it, it's, it's, it's all about just having measurement systems that go, that are aligned. And so my scorecard of the board is, you know, along our four pillars of responsible growth, which would, which would have similarities to what we're talking about. And by the way, that goes all the way through the management team scorecards and all the way down. So you, you just have to have the measurement system is what I've learned over the last several years that take this in. Then CEOs have to relieve people of responsibility. So we did something on sustainable aviation fuel. It costs twice as much. If you're the purchasing manager for you know, our, 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 our teammates traveling and or our, our corporate planes and putting things, I'm asking you to increase your expense pay. You know, in the near term, you just have to say, hey, you can have your budget go up. You know, that's life. We are willing to do that. It's not the most material part of our, our operations that we have to worry about it. You know, but we're willing to do that because it's the right thing to do, and we can set a standard we can do it. So with the First Movers Coalition, we committed to buying, and that helps generate markets. So some of this you have to give some relief to. Um, cost of power, $100 million we spend on power. You have to give a little relief to that group. That's where I think the rub comes in companies is they say, I still want the lowest cost of this, and yet I'm, I want you to do it. You have to say to them, okay, I'm going to give you some relief. But to Alan's point, long term, you'll save money and energy and cost and consumer acceptance. There's a value to this that may be a short long term trade, but CEOs have to set the standard. You're willing to let that trade off be made, not willy nilly. We run the, comp we run the company on 20% less expenses today than we did 15 years ago. Alan, very quickly, yes, we're out of time. So very quickly, um, you need to build business systems. Exhortation from the top does not work. Um, and so if you want to put sustainability at the heart of the company, you need it in your strategy. You need an expert group in the company that knows what they're doing. You need to uh, reward people for it. So one quarter of our senior people's pay is based on progress against ESG metrics. It's only when you get all those aspects of the business system working to, together that you start to see change happening. Uh, exhortation from the CEO doesn't work, I'm afraid. Well, uh, Laura, gentlemen, thanks very much for joining us here for this conversation. I think the message from the panel is very, very clear. We need a harmonization of standards, and we need to ensure that we keep it simple, we keep it real, we keep it pragmatic. And that's the hope that when we meet next, that we would have moved the needle on this one. Ladies and gentlemen, many, many thanks. Thank you very much to the panel. Thank you. Thank you.